Welcome everyone. It's an honor to be with you for today's session. My name is Desi Bahain Salasi, and I'm the uh, Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer, as well as the APAC General Counsel at IHS Market. Our Sarah Week conversation today takes place against the backdrop of a profound tra transition and diversification in the energy industry. And I have the pleasure of being joined by three esteemed panelists who will today share with you their insights and perspectives including uh, pioneering in-flight pilots in their industry that help to address, address the important topic of talent and recruitment. Firstly, welcome to Rhonda Morris, who is Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Chevron Corporation. Ren Rhonda has held several roles at Chevron since joining the firm in 1991 and serves on a number of boards, in addition to that, including TechBridge Girls, which champions equity in STEM education. We're also joined by Amanda Eversole, who's the Chief Operating Officer and an Executive Vice President at American Petroleum Institute, where she leads efforts to integrate a broad range of functions and develops API strategic plans for the natural gas and oil industry. And last but not least, we're pleased to be joined by Byron Okis, who is the CEO and co-founder of Opportunity at Work, where he leads a team pursuing the bold ambition to rewire the US labor market's ways to enable more Americans to achieve upward mobility in the job market and workplace. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, so Jesse. I, thank you. So I'd love to set the scene as we kick things off, and perhaps we can um, hear from Amanda first. Amanda, when we think about attracting a new generation of talent to the industry, what would you say are the perceptions, maybe misconceptions of the energy industry today? And why is it important to establish that understanding in the context of talent and recruitment? Well, thanks so much, Desi. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And just for a little bit of context, the American Petroleum Institute represents about 600 companies across the entire value chain in the natural gas and oil industry in the United States. And I think that's really important because we get a lens from the really big companies to the really small companies and everything in between. And what we know is that between now and 2040, we're gonna have about 1.9 million jobs available in this space. And so we need to think about strategically, how do we attract the right talent for really establishing the future of this industry? And I think your, your question set, asked a, a very, highlighted a very important point, which is, I think there are a lot of misperceptions about this industry. And really, when I step back and look at it, you know, this, the, the, the influence and impact of technology and innovation and the really core attribute of this industry is about problem solving. And when I, when I think about how we really address bringing the talent into, into this industry, it's really a very different complexion than it, what, what it may have been uh, 25 or 50 years ago. And our objective is really to ensure that it is clear that this industry is open for everybody. And we wanna make sure that people understand the broad range of opportunities that are presented in the natural gas and oil industry. Rhonda, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I, I agree with Amanda, and I think um, there's a perception that younger people don't want to come and work in our industry and for a number of our companies. And I constantly like to share data uh, that refutes that. And that doesn't mean that um, it's not something that we keep an active pulse on all of the time. But for example, last summer, we had roughly 500 interns in Chevron from around the world. And these are young people that we're bringing into the company to help us with the energy transition and to help us be part of the solution moving forward. And our offer acceptance rate from our summer interns is the highest it's been in four years. And our internship to full-time hire conversion rate has gone up 10% over the last year. So what we're seeing is positive um, reinforcement from the people that we're bringing into the company, but we're giving them opportunities to learn, to grow, to develop, and not just from a skill standpoint. And we get a lot of feedback. We have a lot of engagement with college students, um, master's degree students, PhDs that we bring into the company. And we're learning from them what exactly is it that they're looking for in companies? What are they looking for in culture? And how do they feel that they can contribute to the energy transition in the future? 
you may receive an application from me, Rhonda. Um, <laughs> we will love to have you. Byron, anything to add to that before we move to the next uh, question? Well, the only thing I would add is that um, I don't think it's possible to overstate the importance of the energy transition and the complexity of it and the, the, the need for the capacities of the existing industry and the transformation of it, and then the talents of both the people in the industry and many who are not yet in the industry. And you know, as industry boundaries are redefined, and as uh, I think it's a time when there could be so much opportunity for people, but, but sometimes when industries have transformed, there's been this thought that the implicit thought that, oh, we're doing new things. So we must need people who, you know, came from Stanford or did this or the other, you know, and it's, and it's, you often see transitions where people who deeply understand the work and do need to learn new skills, but so does everybody else, they can get left behind. So I think in this industry, as you think about the transition, it's both important to open up to new pathways and not to close off pathways to those who've been, been part of the industry. Uh, that takes us really nicely into uh, another area, Byron, I'd like to explore with you. So we've heard about the expanding opportunities in the energy industry, and, and that's just, you know, it's evident, abundantly evident around us. Equally, there's a broad acceptance that diversity drives better decision making. So as energy companies look at their recruitment strategies and look to diversify their talent pools, how do they go about doing so effectively? Right. Well, I mean, look, the energy industry is a huge industry. So in order to answer that question, you have to pull back the lens a bit and look at the scale of the economy. Um, and, you know, in the U.S. economy right now, the latest uh, figures on job openings is there are um, 10.9 million open jobs. Um, uh, there's So for the last few months, there have been more open jobs than there have been people unemployed. Unemployment is still a little bit elevated post-COVID, but open jobs are even more and the gap is widening. So you have this uh, uh, labor shortage, some people say, skills gap, you hear that term a lot. But in fact, if you pull back the lens, um, you have 70 million Americans who are in the workforce today who don't have bachelor's degrees, they have high school degrees and they have skills because they're working. They may also have short course training, they have community college, they may have gained skills in the military, but most of all, they gain it on the job because you can't do a job without having skills. And we, you just can't. And so, and it turns out that a lot of jobs that aren't that well paid actually do demand a lot of skills. And a lot of the skills those lower paid jobs demand are maybe not the entire skill set, but an enormous part of the skill set that higher paid jobs demand. And in fact, you have 30 million people just pre-COVID in the US who in, are in this category. They are, we, we talk about them as being skilled through alternative routes. And of the 70 million people skilled through alternative routes, 30 million have the skills for jobs that pay at least 50% more. Now, some of those jobs might very well be in the oil and gas industry, and these people may be in retail or, or elsewhere. So when you think about um, the demand for those 1.9 million new jobs that Amanda mentioned, um, we shouldn't just be looking to universities. I and mean, you shouldn't just be looking to poach them from other you know, energy companies, because by the way, poaching might help you, but it doesn't, get, it doesn't help net out to any benefit to the 1.9 million. Um, and you, know, you could poach them from your suppliers, but then what are your suppliers going to do? So you, you've really got to open up pathways. And so I think my main message is, for an industry uh, that has this much of a need, both to add talent and to diversify talent, it is incredibly valuable to look to this group of people who are skilled through alternative routes, stars, skilled through alternative routes, and, and to actually figure out where are they, which skills match, um, how do we meet them where they are, how do we give, have, create ways for the industry to understand who's ready to get started and, and maybe to step um, take it a step at a time. It's not that you're going to hire people necessarily into your upper ranks, but they're pathways. And people have skills. They want their learning. They're willing to learn. They want that to lead to greater earning. And with an, with an industry that has these opportunities, I think there's a wonderful moment. And in, And when you talk about diversity in every dimension, this is an incredibly important thing because you need to think hard about 
putting a degree screen, when you say no one that doesn't have a bachelor's degree need to apply for this job, you are ruling out 80% of Hispanic Americans, you're ruling out almost 70% of Black Americans, you are ruling out almost 70% of rural Americans of all backgrounds. And I don't think that's what this industry wants to do. It's, I definitely don't think it's what it needs to do. And so I think there's a real opportunity as we you know, move to this, to this energy transition, as we try to fill those jobs, to really open up the pathways to STARS for skilled for alternative routes. I think that's really interesting, Byron, and I can draw parallels in tech and finance, actually, where this site, sort of enlightened uh, approach would do well. Rhonda, perhaps you could share with us how Chevron are approaching this from a skills perspective and a, you know, thinking beyond the four-year degree requirement. Uh, have you got any stories that perhaps you could share with us from the corporate perspective? Well, I would be happy to, and everything that Byron just outlined is part of the reason or part of the reasons we are really excited to explore the opportunity to work with him and with his organization. But before I answer your question, I wanna take a step back and just um, remind everyone of something we really don't talk about a lot, but that's been true in our industry and specifically in Chevron for quite some time. And that's the fact that we have historically as an industry had very good paying jobs that don't require college degrees. In fact, 23% of our workforce in the United States are in what we call an operator and mechanic job family. And these are jobs that um, include um, welding, they include pipe fitters, boiler makers, electricians, instrumentation analysts. And these jobs have been around um, for, for quite some time. In fact, the average salary for our O&M population in the US is $98,000 per year and that's that's a i think that would fit in the category of a good paying job um, that doesn't have a degree requirement so not only have we historically had these positions i anticipate we're going to have more of them we talk a lot about the energy transition there's also a transition with how we look at and how we define um, talent and skills that are required for jobs and in addition to this existing complement that we have, I anticipate we will have more. And what our partnership with Byron's organization will do will cause us to be introspective and really question um, longstanding paradigms of whether or not we need, um, we really need the degree requirements that we have for some of our job families. And we're in the midst of doing that right now. And Desi, if I might, if I might jump in here. I, I think this is one of the things that's so exciting about the partnership we're talking about today. And from API's perspective, what we bring is not, is not jobs across the industry. We represent companies who can think about this, this um, talent, not only acquisition strategy, but really think about how we're bringing to bear the intellectual capital to drive the future of, of energy. And I think of it so broadly in that way because it truly is the inflection point where we find ourselves today. And, and from an API perspective, if we can provide that platform from the, for the industry to think about talent in a different way, uh, we know that we have to find 1.9 million new jobs. And in fact, a study that we did with IHS, IHS Market says that uh, upwards of 50% of those new entrants will be coming from diverse backgrounds. And I think that's really important because what we need to do is think about how to find people, how to attract people, and how to present the opportunities in this industry in a very different way. And so it, part of this model is to think about approaching it very differently. And tr traditionally, I think we think about workforce recruitment or even training as a, a very company proprietary type approach. Um, but I think what's different here is the industry is saying we're changing and we, we want to find people who are different because we will be better as a result of that. And so I'm really excited about this concept and this partnership uh, because we're bringing the scale of the entire industry to bear here. And we're very optimistic about the, uh, the future that's ahead of us. And I, I don't want to pile on, but 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 I will, Desi, if you just if you just let me. No, no, no. I'd love, I'd love to hear more from this. I, I'll be brief. Um, I just really want to echo what Amanda said because it's pretty incredible that 
we've made a decision to hold hands and do this together. And we talk about solving complex energy problems. And what I've learned over the last, and I've been thinking and, being, and been pretty reflective about how do we solve diversity challenges in companies. And companies tend to look at them through their own single lens of the challenges I have for example, within Chevron versus partnering with other organizations and trying to do this together. So it's not a singular effort. It is an effort that is led by the industry together. And Byron has shared with me, he typically has worked with companies or in specific geographies and not necessarily with an industry organization together. So it feels really good. And it is exciting to be some what part of what feels like a pioneering effort. This is what I'd love to get into a bit more, Rhonda, and, and, and I love the way that um, here we're looking at the industry actually working together instead of solutioning in silos, which we've seen to date doesn't get that scale uh, in terms of results. So it's not just a case of employers removing the four-year degree requirement, right? There has to be something in the alternative to allow us access to these talent pools. So what does skills-based hiring and skilled talent then actually mean from an energy industry perspective. And I'd love to hear each of your perspectives as part of this uh, pilot that you're working on. Well, maybe I'll, I'll jump in and give you a sense because I, there's, a, there's a precursor to this, which is there's a talent pool that doesn't yet understand the opportunity within the natural gas and oil space. And so API is working on a certification program uh, to help provide, a, think of it as a primer course, really in the core elements, the foundational aspects of this industry. We were founded in a, a, in, in a safety culture. Uh, we need to understand the importance of the instrumentation that we use. We need to understand um, the, some of the fundamentals about how we go about doing our work. And so API is in the process of developing a curriculum that will really help across the, across the scale of the industry, just lay some of those critical building blocks for talent to really understand and get a sense of whether or not this is something they want to explore more. The idea is that they complete this one semester course, they come out with a certification and, and companies see that as an opportunity to extend entry-level work, apprenticeships, externships, internships. But it's really a signal that somebody has invested in really discovering opportunities within the industry. I think from that certification, that's one point of training. There are, there are perhaps an infinite ways to go about getting, uh, getting additional skills. But from that, we could connect into the opportunity at work platform that Byron has talked about. And I think it's, it may make sense for him to give us a little bit more background because uh, from there, I think we, get, we, we see where some of the magic happens. I'd be happy to. And I, what I would say is, um, so let me give you a sense of why it's so important for an industry to work together, just sort of tangibly speaking. And it relates to the different ways that you can think about skills-based hiring. So uh, Amanda actually mentioned a number of them just in, in passing there. I mean, there's a lot of ways talent already comes into your organization. There might be internship programs, there might be apprenticeship programs. You might hire um, on campuses, like uh, from, so from an educational institution, or there might be um, classic, and there typically are kind of classic prior experiences, you know, maybe in, in, in some of these operational roles that you know that, you, that, that that's a good place to find people for the next role or for other roles. And all of this is true already. So the question is, how do you expand those ways of thinking to a wider pool? You don't have to reinvent a, a whole way of, of, of doing things. But um, you need to start by stopping keeping people out. The reason the bachelor's degree screen is such a damaging thing is not only does it exclude um, a very high proportion of people and, you know, of all people, but then certainly of like more sort of diverse, you know, kind of groups coming in, but it stops them before you assess their skills, right? So it's not as if you've assessed their skills and found on average they don't do as well. You literally have have paid money to not see what they can do and to keep them from finding out whether this might be a good match for them. So it's really actually, if you think about it, very destructive. So why would anyone do this? I mean, these are smart people running companies. Well, they do it because 
if you have 500 people apply for a job, you don't have an easy way. I mean, it's very time consuming and expensive. So the problem is, so you have to find some way to screen the right people in for consideration because you can't consider everyone. But when you take this route of, of screening out within this degree, you're not getting a wide variety of people. But then how do you screen them in is the question. So first, like the example of the curriculum, have they got an orientation to even understand what they're getting into and a kind of an orientation to safety culture and they both know what they need and they know that this is something they want to do. That's a pretty good screen, right? Because that's not something that's exclusionary. That's sort of like, you know, it helps you have a fit. Or um, you could have skills demonstrations, or you could have programs that you, you know that are not bachelor's or master's degree programs that actually have those, those potential fits. Or you could take your early stage training and make it available, the first two or three modules for someone you would have already hired. Hey, if they can sort of demonstrate that, maybe you get it. But the other thing, so there's a lot of ways you can do it. If you do it as an industry, the advantage is this. I might be a job applicant and in some sense, I know what I can do, but I don't know what you need as a company. And if there are, there's so many different jobs, I've never heard of most of these jobs. I don't know if I'm qualified for them, but if I show up and there's a bunch of different jobs that I might get to and learn, like uh, the job I might be ready for is a job I've literally never heard of. And so if it's only one company for one role that I'm applying to, what are the odds that I'm the single best person for that job in that one company at that one time? They're not very high, not because there's anything wrong with me, but because there's one job and lots of people applying. But if you can basically have access to the whole range of jobs and find out through the tools that are created by the industry, you can do much better. And then Opportunity at Work tries to, excel to accelerate that. We depend, we certainly don't know better than Rhonda and Amanda and their colleagues in the industry, what the exact skill sets are for the job, they bring that knowledge and that demand signal, if you will. But what we do have is we have a database of, for example, of the exact skills distance between all the jobs in the US economy and every other job. So in saying like, where would you look at pools of people that you haven't looked at classically? If you can tell us what the sort of skills you need, we can say, hey, these are pretty close over here. And then you can look there, you might not have before. And those jobs might have a very different gender mix. There might be far more women like coming through those pathways than have historically come into a set of your jobs. There certainly could be far more African Americans or or Hispanic Americans. So there's there's a so there's all of those opportunities. And then the other thing we have is a database of 140 million job transitions over the last change. So you can actually see how people move through the economy. And that's through a little bit of this jungle of the labor market with all these barriers. And you know, there's the story of the cow paths in Boston, that, that that's where they then made the roads. It's a little bit like that. Like people are, despite all the barriers, they're finding their way through and we can see where it is and widen those pathways on purpose is incredibly powerful. So, because this is a market problem, you can't centrally plan your way to solving it. You need the demand signal and you need to see what's going on. On the other hand, it really is a collective action problem. Because if we all just optimize for our individual companies, you know, I, I predict that Chevron could win the poaching war for quite a while. <laughs> but you. like if Chevron wins, somebody <laughs> else loses and the industry doesn't grow. And that's the final thing I'll say about it that's so important for the industry. The right pathway for Chevron or might be someone who has been in the industry in another company for five years. But if no one can get into their, that job in the first place, right, then, then it's a zero sum game. So it, it, this is, I think there's, I'm very excited about the potential. We do tend to work with groups of companies that works better, but to work with an industry that has such a wide variety of jobs, that has so many sort of specialties and subspecialties. And as Rhonda mentioned, a tradition of having very responsible, very skilled jobs that don't assume the need for a bachelor's degree. I, I, I'm, I'm excited at the progress we can make together. Byron, one of the things that just jumps out to me is just to summarize what you said, is just, if you can see it, you can be it. And yeah. I think part of what we're trying to do is bring that, that transparency and bring, bring the, the opportunity from the industry to bear, you know, what skills do I need to acquire in order to make myself a viable candidate for one of these jobs to, that pay twice on average um, for, for what other roles in non-degree uh, non uh, fields may hold? I mean, that's, who doesn't want to make twice as much money? If Most people can, do in my right? experience, yeah. <laughs> 
And look, this is a very forward way of thinking about matching talent based on skills rather than an assumed pedigree based on, you know, traditional uh, attributes like uh, degrees and, and, and that sort of thing. I really would love to hear then, Rhonda, from your perspective, you know, for the MNCs, for the energy companies to change their mindset, how, how is that looking internally at Chevron and, and amongst your peer group when we think about the, the, that skills-based assessment? So this is, um, I think I mentioned earlier, this is the time for us to really challenge long-term and long-held paradigms. And I'm pretty pleased to admit as a company and as even our executive leadership team, we're being pretty introspective. And earlier this year, we made a decision to remove, um, and I'm gonna start not necessarily with degrees, but with grade point average requirements. Chevron has long um, been pretty prescriptive of what schools we, we will go to to recruit talent. We've been very prescriptive about uh, grade point average requirements and they're usually pretty high. And this year we have um, done pretty thorough assessments of where we're recruiting, where we're looking at talent. We have as part of our racial equity plan, a, a stronger partnership with historically black colleges and universities. We've partnered with them for many, 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 many years, but we're looking at how do we manage these relationships differently to drive different outcomes and bring in more diverse talent into the company. But the big decision that we made um, that has challenged a long held paradigm is to remove GPA requirements from candidates that we look at. And that might sound simple, but um, simple is hard. That was hard for us, but that's the beginning of a cultural shift. The pilot that Byron's organization has in Northern California right now, we have some positions included in that pilot that were traditionally roles that had degree requirements. And I believe they're IT positions, but again, um, I would be, it would be disingenuous to say that these are easy conversations and we're just making this shift very quickly of, oh, this job requires, uh, historically required a degree and now it doesn't. We're thinking long and hard and deeply about why we've done what we've done in the past and really asking the question, does this position really require the degree that we assigned to it in the past. The second thing we're doing from a skills standpoint, we have a pretty extensive digital academy and technology. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at what types of megatrends will impact the industry and which, and which ones will impact our company. And technology is number one on the list, rapidly changing technology. So in addition to changing how we bring people into the company, we've got a dedicated investment in how we continue to upskill them. And we've got tons of courses that are focused on artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, agile methodology. So once we bring people into the organization, learning doesn't stop. So we are building this continuous learning culture. And um, I will, I'll finish by sharing, I listened to a talk Byron gave several years ago, it was actually in Singapore, I believe. And he mm -hmm. talked about um, fear that people have that technology will cause us to eliminate jobs and we'll have fewer jobs versus realizing that there will be new jobs that are created and there are jobs that will actually change. And a ex short example I will share, um, we have a number of refineries. We use tons of technology in our refineries. So technology is always changing. We're continuously training our employees. And I've spent time working in a number of our refineries, but in, in the past, um, a piece of equipment that needed to be inspected would be inspected by a person who walks, rides a bike or drives throughout this huge plant to go inspect this piece of equipment. And now there's technology that you can have a drone go to that piece of equipment. There's a camera and the person can be in a control room or a different place within the facility. And they can use the technology, this advanced technology to do the exact same work in a different way and in, in a more efficient way. I, um, I'm really excited by everything I've heard, and I'm uh, expecting and anticipating that many of our audience will be thinking about their own journeys and thinking about everything they've heard. So perhaps from each of you, we could hear what advice do you have for organizations that are considering removing these higher education qualif qualifications or at least moving towards this alternative path? that we've heard about in skills-based hiring? And how does one even begin that process? How does one persuade a leadership team that knows 
but it always has been done one particular way to change and to adopt the new way. So perhaps I'll throw that out to you, Amanda, and then we can move to Rhonda. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I, I first started the business imperative, right? We have we have a growing number of opportunities uh, in terms of employment within this industry. We have an aging workforce, and we know that we're going to need new skills, not just to replace the jobs that exist, the jobs of today, but we know that the jobs of tomorrow are going to be different. And so from a perspective of just simply, we need to have the workers in order to conduct our business effectively and efficiently. That's the baseline business predicate. I also think of, I'm, I tend to be a glass half full person. I also think about the opportunity, which is we are an infle at an inflection point within our society. And I think asking, uh, challenging conventional wisdom, asking why, why does this degree requirement hold? Do we need this going forward? And I think if the net result is that we may do be able to do things differently and expect a different result, and that might accrue to the benefit of a more diverse workforce, a more efficient workforce, and the ability to bring in different skills in order to meet the changing needs of this in industry, we are, of course, going through a transformation as we think about in uh, energy writ large. And to me, I think about that as one of the greatest opportunities. For, uh, to, to think about it on the flip side, if we were to say, let's just enjoy the status quo, I think just clinically looking at it from a business perspective, I don't think we can, uh, we can expect the same outcomes that we, uh, in order to meet the demands of the future. So to me, it's a pretty clear, straightforward business imperative. Rhonda? So I'll start by stating the obvious. We are a very complex industry and we solve very complex problems. So I would say three things. Um, I, collectively, we need to think differently. Um, we need to learn, number two, we need to learn from others. And number three, we need to collaborate. And what we've seen over the last, uh, Amanda, I think it's been 12 to 14 months that we've had this coalition together is that we're doing that. Um, we haven't partnered on anything of this size or scale ever. And I will give a shout out to Parker Drilling. Um, Byron and his team have come in and talked to us a couple of times. And every time he does that, his, his phone starts ringing or he starts getting emails or, or calls are contacted. And, and Amanda mentioned the breadth of size and scale of API memberships. So we've got the majors, we've got our suppliers, we've got our partners, all of whom are willing to kind of hold hands together and help solve a complex talent challenge that we all have on behalf of the success of the entire in industry and to help with the energy transition collectively. Yeah, and if I, if I could just add, because I've, I've seen it across a lot of different companies, a lot of different industries, um, and I, I want to acknowledge it, it, it is hard to wrap your heads around it because the last, particularly the last 30 or 40 years in this country, we've kind of gotten into both a set of systems and a, a kind of a mindset that, you know, that there's this vertical hierarchy of, of merit based on how well you take tests. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's some real world activities that are, look like taking tests, but like most things you have to do in the world don't look like that very much. And, and the diversity of people's talents and their, and their drive and what lights them up and like what they like are committed to. And some people think, and they don't even know necessarily how best to deploy it because there's like 2000 jobs and like people know what five of them do to Amanda's point, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it, you know, what your teacher and nurse and right. And then, you know, maybe what your family does, but if your family has never been part of this industry or has never been part of say a technical path or even a sales path, I mean, there's so many jobs that you really don't understand and you won't be exposed to, but people are problem solvers. So much of the dialogue about people, particularly people who don't have, you know, advanced degrees or like, we talk about like their problems, but they're not, they're not problems to be solved. They are literally problem solvers and we work is solving problems and we need way more problem solvers because Last I checked, we're not running out of problems. I mean, maybe you think so. I don't think so. It seems like we've got quite a few to work on. The energy transition being a non-trivial one, right? And so, like, we need all we need this talent, and that's I, I think this is not a zero sum situation. If like if our economy worked in a zero sum way, we would all still be living in caves. It's not the case, right? You bring more talent, you solve more problems, things work better, 
new problems emerge or new opportunities. And so that's the way it actually works. And we've got to remember that. And then we also have to remember, this is not either or. We're not saying like engineering degrees don't matter. Of course they do. There's so many different roles and these are complementary. We're not so, in other words, no one should feel threatened that their you know, credentials or the hard work they've done doesn't count. Of course it counts and it matters, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way you can get skills that are relevant to a wide variety of the jobs. So, and then I would, the final thing I would say, and this thing, it actually helps for people to think about the personal a little bit, because if you start asking, I guarantee you in Chevron, no matter how elite the company, there will be people in very important roles who don't have bachelor's degrees. And you might not even know it because you never bothered to ask them. Because remember, these degree requirements really shot up after, after the um, financial crisis and the, the kind of great recession and the sort of the jobs period where, you know, and so there's a lot of people. So in our data, I mentioned 70 million stars in the US who are skilled through alternative routes. I didn't mention 5 million of them are already in high wage jobs. And the two most common job categories for those high wage stars are software developer and CEO. Why CEO? Because so many of them get so frustrated inside companies. That's like, I can do the job, but like, you can't get a promotion. Even if you're in, you can't get a promotion because you don't have this degree. It's like, what? I'm literally doing this job right now. And so a lot of them choose, say, well, I will let customers decide and they go start a business. So that's the final thing I would say it, that if you, if you don't recognize people's skills simply because they lack the pedigree and the stamp of approval, like you might meet them again as your competitor instead of as your employee, because you can't afford to freeze out skills just because it didn't come in the exact same form you've always looked for it. And so that is, and that's a real thing. Like the, the, it is not a, it's, it's not just a, you know, a cliche that winning the war for talent matters. It really, really does because that's who does the work. Thank you so much for that. I, I, we have just a few minutes left, so I wanted to give you each an opportunity to uh, give your final comment or a call to action. Um, so I'd love to hear that from you. And just to say, you know, I found your comments just then at the end very inspirational. I have a 10-year-old son doing exams next month who feels it will be the end of his life if he fails. Um, so really hearing about an industry, thinking about the richness and diversity of people's talents and skills versus exam results is, is really refreshing and, and a pleasant reminder. So I'll just go around the table. Maybe, Byron, you can give us your call to action, final comment, and then we'll move on to Rhonda and Amanda. Well, my call to action is that um, we need all the talents to solve these problems. And... Um, you know, I, I think as you alluded to, it's very hard to for one company or one government age, it's not going to happen. Like, no, we can't solve these problems alone. And we definitely are not going to solve them by accident. The way to solve them is working together and doing it on purpose. And so I'm very happy that we've, you know, got this partnership to to really make that happen in, you know, some of the most important uh, parts of, of, of the economy and, and, and places like, like Houston, that's an incredible diversity in every respect. And, and also that the industry in places like Houston will welcome others too, like other industries, other companies that it, it will get the snowball rolling because again, it's not a zero sum game. We can, if we bring out all the talents and, and open up pathways, we'll be able to solve so many more problems than, uh, than if we don't. Thank you, Byron. Um, Rhonda, if I could come to you. I think I would talk about what we started with, which were perceptions of the industry. And again, a reminder that this is an industry that for a very, very long time has employed people in good paying jobs who didn't have degrees. In fact, my grandfather worked for Exxon. He did not have a college degree. He worked in their Baton Rouge refinery. And I think this is a huge opportunity for our industry to lead by example and to lead by doing. Amanda. Yeah, I look at, first of all, thank you for, for convening us today. We're so excited about this partnership, the, the proprietary solution through technology that Byron and his team have put together, the leadership that Chevron has brought to this, this topic of 
of how to bring the skilled workforce to bear uh, and for benefit of this industry. Um, from my perspective, the call to action is simple. Join us. Join us on this mission. Uh, whether you're an API member or not, in the coming months, we're, gonna, we're going to roll out um, a, a pilot in the Houston area in trying to figure out how do we leverage the, the tool that Byron has brought to, brought to bear with the infrastructure in the energy capital of the world. And our ambition is, is big, but I think it's quite achievable. And at the core of this industry, we are the problem solvers. And so I am very optimistic at the opportunity that we have ahead and look forward to others joining us. You can reach out to me at API and we look forward to the participation. Thanks so much. That's fantastic ending. Thank you, Byron. Thank Rhonda. you, Desi. Thank you so you, Desi. much for your insights and your valuable time today. I, for one, have really taken a lot of notes to reflect on. Thank you also to our audience for joining us. There will be more to come on this topic in future Sarah Week conversations. So please watch the space. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.